Hello again. Uh, today's lecture is on magnetism, uh, the nature of magnetism, why it exists, and where we see it in nature, and a few of its applications in our technology. Here's one application. This crane is picking up a bunch of scrap iron with an electromagnet. It's a very convenient way to pick up large quantities of iron. So how does magnetism work? Well, we've talked about the electrostatic force. This is the repulsive or attractive force between charged particles. Electrons are attracted to protons, which is why atoms exist, right, and why molecules exist and why chemical reactions occur. Protons also repel each other, electrons repel each other. Those uh, repulsive or attractive forces are extremely important in the way matter works, you know, holds us together. But there's another aspect to the EM force. EM stands for electromagnetic. There's the electrostatic force, which is the E, and then the magnetic force, which is the M. And the magnetic force is a force between electric currents. So we've already seen electric current. If uh, some of the electrons in a wire can move through it because metals conduct electricity. And electric currents that are near each other can exert forces on each other. So now these two wires shown in this diagram here, they both have electric currents in it and there's a force between them as a result. They don't have any electric charge or no net electric charge because in normal matter there's the same number of electrons as protons, right? So neither one has an electric charge so there's no electrostatic force between them. But when current is running in each one then there's a magnetic force. If the current shuts off in one or both then that magnetic force will stop. It's a, it's a force between two electric currents. And the way physicists think about it, when electric current moves through a wire, in this uh, case the, the electrons would be going toward the left, it generates a, what's called a magnetic field around it. So they're just showing circular loops of magnetic field around this wire. Now, magnetic field isn't actually lines going through space. The magnetic field around this wire Per pervades the whole space around it. It's strongest near the wire and go gets weaker as you get further away. So I'm just showing a small part of the magnetic field. The, the, they draw lines because it's, it's, it's a way that we can draw things that represent the structure of the field. Now if there's another wire going through this field which, which has current in it, it'll uh, experience a force. And as I said, so this red wire is going through the entire space around this green wire, so it's going to uh, feel uh, force from the magnetic field at all different points along here, so not just at that blue point, but I'm just trying to show you the direction of the force at that blue point. So here I'm zoomed in on it, and <clears throat> the purple arrow shows the direction of the force between it. It's at a right angle, to the magnetic field generated by the green wire, and it's also at a right angle to the uh, direction of the current in the red wire. So this is a little different from the electrostatic force where it's just attractive or repulsive. This can be in different directions depending on the direction of the, of the two currents. So that makes it uh, a little bit more interesting. And this has many applications in technology. Here's a major one. This is an electric motor. I think this is from a vacuum cleaner. And this part around the outside, this is called the stator, the part that doesn't move. And you can see hundreds of loops of, of wire looping around there. When this thing's running, there's electric currents running through those loops of wire, which produce magnetic fields. And then the rotor, the part that rotates, also has hundreds of loops of electric wire. When the motor is running, there's current running through those wires. And the electric motor is designed in such a way that the current can be uh, switched on or off or controlled in ways where the stator current exerts a magnetic force on the rotor currents and it, and it exerts a torque on the rotating part which makes it go around. So this is a way to use electric current to cause mechanical movement through the magnetic force. And uh, there's just millions of different applications of uh, electric motors. Of course, you have one in your, in your vacuum cleaner, but there's also one in your refrigerator that runs the compressor in the refrigerator that makes it refrigerate. Uh, there's 
motors in your HVAC system that blow air and also refrigerate or heat it. Uh, there's motors in your car that like run the windows up and down. There's thousands of motors in your life probably. Yeah, there's motors in your computer too that like to run the little fan and maybe if you've still got a disk drive, which most computers don't have it these days, um, it makes, it, that's what spins that thing. So there's, there's just many, many applications of electric motors. So a major application of magnetism in technology. Uh, another application is uh, loudspeakers and microphones. So as I speak here, the sound is being recorded on this video camera by a microphone. How is that working? Well, the sound waves are propagating out of my mouth and toward the microphone of the video camera. They hit a, the microphone has a diaphragm, which is shaken back and forth slightly by the sound wave that's striking it. That um, has a little magnet on it, and it causes an oscillating electric current in a wire through magnetism. And the, the the electric current in that wire has an oscillating form that is the same waveform as the sound wave that's coming out of my mouth. So that is recorded somehow in the uh, video camera. And then when you're listening to this, that same signal is, <clears throat> is run through a wire that goes through a magnet, uh, through a coil on the loudspeakers of your computer, and that causes a magnet to, to oscillate with that same waveform, which which moves a diaphragm, which produces the same sound wave. And ideally, it, it uh, accurately reproduces the sound wave, although it isn't exactly the same. Uh, but, that's, but this is one of the major applications of magnetism. Now, some microphones and speakers don't operate on this principle these days. There's different kinds of electrical ways to turn sound waves into electrical signals and electrical signals into sound waves. But this is... Um, uh, maybe still the most common, especially in larger speakers. So there's another application of magnetism. Here's one that um, you may or may not have seen before. This is an MRI machine. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. This big donut-shaped thing is a huge coil of wire through which there's loads of current, and that produces a very, very strong magnetic field. The reason they wheel this person in there is because when when your tissue is in the, this magnetic field, every one of your atomic nuclei that make you up have little magnetic fields and they'll line up with that magnetic field. And then through other um, instruments, they can make maps of the atomic nuclei and each type of nucleus, like a carbon nucleus or an oxygen nucleus or a nitrogen nucleus, has its own signature uh, to these instruments. And so they, what they basically do is they make a three-dimensional map of the different elements in your body. That's how they map out the different structures within your body. So, and this is someone's hands uh, taken with an MRI, and you can see the three-dimensional structure of stuff inside these hands. And it's not only it's not only the layer that you see here, but they have they have a complete three-dimensional image through there. So the doctors can look at slices at different depths, right, and different parts within you. It's a very very successful type of medical imaging that uh, tells you a lot more than things like x-rays. It's a huge expensive machine, so MRIs are expensive to get, um, but it's pretty amazing technology. Another application of magnetism. Uh, and of course there's magnetic memory, which is not as common anymore in computers, but uh, magnetic tape um, um, data is stored magnetically on a magnetic memory. and. Uh, so I think they're still used to some extent in computer memory. Now, so I've been talking, I, I said that uh, magnetism is a force between electric currents, but the magnets that you're probably most familiar with are the little refrigerator magnets that just stick onto a refrigerator, and those don't appear to have electric current in them, right? They're just solid bits of whatever they are, and, but they still have magnetic fields, they still stick to things, they, they stick to the refrigerator, which isn't even a magnet, right? It's just a piece of steel. So why does that work? Well, it turns out that in all matter, all electrons, of course electrons have charge, right? They also have a thing called spin. They're basically spinning. So that little electric charge is going around in a little current, 
And so there's every electron has a little circulating current. Now, the reason my hand is not magnetic is because for every electron spinning one way in my hand, there's an electron spinning the other way, and the little magnetic fields, they cancel each other out. So most matter is not normally magnetic. And you see here's two electrons spinning the opposite way. You know, we talked about in the chemistry section that electrons oftentimes pair up. They pair up in these opposite spin pairs like this. Um, okay, so in most matter, you don't have a net electric current because for every spin that's going one way, there's spin going the other way. But in some materials, like especially iron, a whole bunch of the electrons can get lined up so that they're all spinning the same way. The little electron current is going the same way. You have a net current inside there because of that and a net magnetic field. So in the right, on the right you see the, the electrons paired up, one going one way, one going another. And on the left, a lot of them are lined up. And <clears throat> the way iron is the most magnetic of the elements, there's different magnetic materials, but iron's the most magnetic. In those materials, on a microscopic scale, there are little domains where a bunch of the electrons have their uh, spins lined up. And so each one of those little grains is an individual magnet. And this is your microscopic little, what they call magnetic domains. But if you put that in a magnetic field, they'll all temporarily line up. Take away the magnetic field, they'll all go back to oriented in different ways. So under normal circumstances, iron or steel is not a magnet. You can turn it into a magnet, though, by putting the field on it and then heating it up to a certain temperature and lowering it back down. Then it'll become permanently magnetized. That's how they make refrigerator magnets. They're not all made of iron, but most are based on iron and other elements. Um, and you know that, so here's a permanently magnetized piece of iron. So here's a a permanent magnet. It's a whole bunch of its electrons are lined up, so there's effectively an electric current in there generating its magnetic field. And when you put two of these near each other, they'll either attract or repel, right? Uh, two magnets can attract or repel. They'll, they'll attract if you've got them oriented like this, so their magnetic fields are lined up, and they'll repel if you've got them oriented like this, so they're anti-aligned. That is why Magnets have a north pole and a south pole that uh, you know that you can, you know, they either repel each other or attract each other. Now, what about um, a regular piece of steel, a, a permanent magnet? You can stick it on the refrigerator because the refrigerator is made of steel. Why does it stick to the refrigerator? Why does it attract the steel of the refrigerator? Well, because when a regular piece of steel is near a magnet, then it's little... Um, magnetic domains all line up with each other and it temporarily becomes a magnet. After you take the magnet off the refrigerator, those things go back to their randomly oriented condition and it's no longer a magnet. So, um, and of course, you can put this magnet, or this piece of metal, which is on the right, you can put it near either end of that thing. It'll magnetize the same way as the magnet is and so it'll always be attracted. So a magnet always attracts. So here's this is a horseshoe magnet. They make a horseshoe out of it because the two ends of the horseshoe are the strong magnetic field ends. And if you put them in the same direction, then you got twice as much pulling power on a piece of uh, iron or steel. And, um, and it makes it, you can make a pretty strong magnet this way. Now, there's also magnetic fields in nature. You probably know that the Earth has a strong magnetic field and um, it's being generated in the core of the Earth. The core of the Earth is made of iron. The outer core is molten iron. The fact that it's iron and molten and the Earth is spinning and there's heat coming from it, so those all um, cause what's called the geodynamo, which generates a fairly strong magnetic field. And this is important probably to the habitability of the Earth's surface because it deflects um, material that comes from outer space, like material that comes off the sun, which it actually blows off because it's magnetic. Now uh, here's um, a diagram of the magnetic generation mechanism in the core of the Earth. You can see it's pretty complicated. It looks like a bunch of spaghetti in there. You know, it's actually quite complicated to simulate this. Uh, and it was a very long time before people that try to simulate this 
were able to produce a simulation that that replicates the dynamics of the Earth's magnetic field, uh, but it's thought to be fairly well understood these days. This is the Sun's magnetic field. The Sun is also very active, and uh, it produces a really complicated, extremely strong magnetic field. And um, it's it doesn't have any molten iron in it, but its whole the Sun's entire mass is plasma which is the atoms of it that are so hot that the electrons and protons are moving independently of each other, so it's an electrically conducting material. And um, that's what produces the magnetism in the sun. So now the sun blows off material all the time, um, which is called solar wind, and this is caused by its magnetic activity. Here's um, a close-up of the sun. I think this is shot in ultraviolet light and you can see these these loops of magnetic field that are emanating from inside the sun carrying energy toward the surface. You can see how bright it is at the places where the uh, magnetic field poked through the surface because it's very hot there so there's a lot of energy involved in the sun's magnetic field. Now this is the planet Jupiter a diagram of its magnetic field. It has a very strong magnetic field. It doesn't have iron or plasma on its inside but there's metallic hydrogen of all things on the inside of the sun, that uh, it's a liquid metallic hydrogen state that generate that appears to generate the magnetic field, and um, you can see this yellow ring around it. One of the interesting things about the Jupiter's magnetic field is that it there's a moon inside this ring. It's which is volcanic. It's spewing stuff into space. Some of that stuff gets swept up in the, mag the rotating magnetic field of the sun, and and it produces this gas torus that's constantly orbiting the sun. This torus actually emits radio energy and some of the static on your radio or your TV actually comes from Jupiter. Jupiter is a bright radio source in our sky as a result of this magnetic field. Now, there are also very um, strong magnetic fields out in the universe on things called neutron stars, probably the strongest magnetic fields in the universe, and uh, these are dead stars that just have very, very strong magnetic activity that um, that we can see sometimes as pulsars. Now, one of the most important uh, places where magnetism occurs in nature is in electromagnetic radiation. The electrostatic force between protons and electrons, that force is mediated by what's called the electric field. So a proton generates an electric field, which an electron can can uh, be forced by, and then a magnetic field is produced by electric currents, right? So there's two types of fields, electric field and magnetic field. A changing electric field produces a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. This pro causes what's called electromagnetic radiation. These changing fields produce each other and propagate through space. Electromagnetic radiation is another word for light and radio energy and ultraviolet energy and uh, infrared and x-rays and gamma rays. So this is what, this is how energy travels through space, mostly in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So this is maybe the most familiar uh, location of magnetism to you. There are other things where, where magnetic effects are important, like even within atoms. I told you that an electron has its own magnetic field, so does the nucleus. They can interact in important ways that uh, that have to do with magnetism. But here's just a, a fairly brief overview of magnetism in nature and in technology.